Welcome everyone to our Ato Fridays. It is kind of strange that we never invited our Quantum Battles collaborator to talk, maybe because we don't want to be accused of nepotism, but we are very happy <laughs> that he is here today with Dr. Andrew Brown from Queen's University, Belfast. And he's a reader in theoretical physics at the Center for Light Matter Interaction at Queen's University, Belfast. And he's also the holder of a research software engineering fellowship from UK Research and Innovation. And his physics research focuses on the development and application of the R matrix with time dependence theory and associated high performance computer codes to problems in nanosecond science. And uh, his fellowship, which is on research software engineering, focuses on developing new tools and practices for sustainable software development in atomic, molecular, and optical physics, which I think is unbelievably brave because I know sometimes I just have to move fast and break things while he tries to do it properly. And he shares his home office space with three daughters who probably make an appearance in the background of his out of Friday's talk. So uh, I think we all got used to this during the pandemic that we had kids and cats and, and all the family coming by. And his talk is going to be also about uh, an old bunny, so rabbit hop, new angles on an old bunny, which is perfect for after Easter because we had an Easter break. I hope you all enjoyed it and had the chance to chase bunnies and stuff. So, Andrew, uh, feel free to start. The floor is yours. Thank you, Carla. And and thank you so much for the invitation uh, to, to share my work with you. Um, yeah, so I was part of the the original inception of, of Quantum Battles back in 2020, but everything that's happened since with Auto Fridays has, has, been, has come from your group at, at UCL. So th thank you for keeping this going and, and providing this service to the community. Um, as Carla says, uh, my name's Andrew Brown. For those who haven't uh, met me before, uh, I'm based in Belfast. Uh, and my work over the last 10 years really has been um, to kind of help with the development of this R matrix with time dependence code um, and the theory associated with that. Um, and the work that I'm going to share with you today uh, really is uh, has been the product of a big collaboration between uh, our group in Belfast um, and physicists all around the world, but primarily the, the sort of experimental efforts of Zhejun Gong uh, and his students uh, and Jian Wu uh, at the East China Normal University. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of name check them again later on when I show you the results. Um, but for context, um, I want to sort of start by telling you a little bit about uh, the R matrix of time dependence code and the way that we go about um, doing out of second science. Um, and uh, just so we can sort of uh, set the context for, for the, the sort of broader work that we're doing. Uh, and then uh, in the results section, if you like, I'll focus on the stuff that we've been doing, extending the rabbit technique um, into uh, sort of new regimes, uh, and in particular into um, what we're now calling rabbit hop, which is uh, the rabbit with higher order processes. Uh, I realized fairly, fairly early on in my academic career that one of my core competencies is coming up with good acronyms for things. But this one I can't take credit for. This is entirely um, from my, my PhD student, Luke, who I know is on the call. So Luke, thank you for coming up with rabbit hop. So I, I'm, not, I'm not able to show some of the results that we have for rabbit hop just yet. I will give a sort of sneak preview of that, but we're working on submitting this or preparing this for, for submission at the minute. So um, I'll focus more on some of the already published results and give us a sneak preview of rabbit hop uh, at the end. So the way that we go about doing our research um, is uh, in some sense quite simple. Um, all we really do is solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Um, but in the context of out of second science, the work that we do really sits between two extremes. And, I, and I, this is the way I tend to think about the work that we do. Um, so the kind of concepts and concerns of people who work in the out of second science community, um, and obviously they're very broad and I'll come back to that concept uh, in a little while. But um, when I think about a second science, the things I think about are this, right? This is what I did my PhD on, the um, high harmonic generation. This is the, uh, the semi-classical three set model from Paul Corkum. And so the concerns of people who work in this side of out of second science um, is really to do with um, characterizing your laser and describing processes, strong fields, uh, and so on. Uh, the other side of our work really is more to do with atomic physics and traditional atomic physics. The, the image that kind of conjures in my head 
uh, is this kind of thing, okay? NIST data tables and getting really highly accurate um, numbers for um, transition strengths and um, energies uh, and so on. And there's a whole bunch of uh, sort of computational physics history um, behind all of this as well, um, which uh, a lot of which um, kind of originated or uh, sort of took place in Belfast as well, um, which uh, we're sort of proud of, even though I had nothing to do with it as long before I was born. But when you bring these two things together, um, really what we're trying to do then is to describe the, uh, the, the atomic systems, not just in terms of their energies and transition strengths and various things like that, but really trying to describe the dynamics of electrons within atomic systems um, in order to be able to speak to the concerns of people in the out of second science community. Uh, and when we bring these two things together, you get what is technically called really cool physics. Um, and that's where we work. Um, but in order to enable this, overlap, we really need to add a third piece to this puzzle or a third circle to this Venn diagram, which is uh, high performance computing. Because if you want to maintain the level of detail in the description of your atomic system um, it, and put that into realistic light fields in order to describe out of second processes, you really need to add in this third part, which is the high performance computing. And much of what we do uh, and much of the work that um, my students uh, and I work on is in sort of uh, building up the capability of our computer code and, and deploying it on these massively parallel systems. And at the intersection of these three areas, not only do you have really cool physics, but you have really hard work. Um, and maintaining um, skills across these three areas is, is particularly difficult. And so I'm so proud of the work that um, our PhD students and postdocs do um, to sort of keep the R matrix with time independence project moving forward. Conceptually, uh, the R matrix of time dependence method is, is very straightforward. All we really do is solve this thing, um, which is uh, a straightforward partial differential equation. And indeed, if you um, massively simplify your system um, and uh, you know treat, for instance, a, a single active electron um, in, a, in some sort of central potential, this thing is very tractable and easy to solve. All of the complexity of solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation is hidden away in this guy, in the wave function. And if you want to describe a multi-electron system, this wave function is a multi-dimensional beast. Um, and the associated Hamiltonian that goes with that is necessarily very complex as well. And in fact, I'll show you an image um, which conveys some of that in a second. But the R matrix of time dependence code um, relies on other methods, um, other R matrix based methods to produce these quantities, the, the, a description of the wave function, which accounts for the multi electron effects and the associated Hamiltonian um, dipole couplings and so on. And then RNT effectively is just a highly parallelized propagator, which takes us from some initial wave function through to the wave function sometime later. Um, and once we have that wave function in principle, uh, we, we have everything we need to describe uh, the, the, the interactions and the processes and the observables. So how does our matrix with time dependence accomplish this? Well, this is the basic idea of our matrix theory. It's what we call the R matrix division of space. So here we have a cartoon of our little multi-electron system. And the idea with this R matrix division of space is that when all of the electrons are close to each other, this is when you really need to worry about the details uh, of, the, of the physics that's going on. So the multi-electron effects, and in particular the electron exchange, um, are most prevalent in some small region of space around the atomic nucleus. Um, but if one electron should find itself far from this nucleus for some reason, say we ionize our system and an electron pops out here, now this electron is uh, spatially isolated from the residual ion, and from its perspective, it sort of sees some long range um, potential acting on it. Um, and the, the particular thing which makes it um, sort of slightly easier then is that because it's spatially isolated, we don't have any electron exchange. And this massively simplifies the uh, description. And so by dividing space into these two regions and kind of solving the Schrodinger equation kind of differently um, in each of these two regions, we make the solution tractable. Um, and uh, the way I, I kind of conceptualize this is to think uh, of, of our space as kind of having this small region in which the description is quite complex and a very large region potentially um, in which the description is much simpler. And the reason we need a large region is because if we are describing uh, processes in strong fields, for instance, um, we, we need to be able to describe electron excur excursions where the electron el electronic wave packet goes far away and, and returns. 
Um, and so you need uh, potentially a very large outer region in order to capture those dynamics. And traditionally, the way these R matrix methods work is to connect uh, these two regions with what's called the R matrix. And the big secret in the R matrix community is that nobody knows what the R stands for. Um, RMT does things slightly differently. We, we actually match the wave function explicitly on this boundary so that the solution of the Schrodinger equation on the, in the inner region serves as a boundary condition for the solution in the outer region and vice versa. Uh, and this then allows us to describe the wave function flux across this boundary so that we can describe outgoing wave packets in photoionization, for instance, or a returning wave packet in strong field recollision, for instance. So by making this division of space and by making clever use of um, uh, different numerical techniques in the inner and outer region and so on, we come up with a tractable way of solving this trend dependent Schrodinger equation. And as I mentioned before, just propagating some initial condition where we have our atom in its ground state through to some final state in the presence of an electric field. An important year in the development of RMT was 2016. Um, and, I, and I like to kind of start most of my talks uh, by, by mentioning this so that I can kind of establish the context for the developments that have taken place since uh, and, and sort of explain something of the complexity of what RMT is capable of doing. In 2016, what RMT was capable of was describing atoms and only atoms um, in linearly polarized pulses. So we couldn't describe any processes in our, our circularly polarized uh, pulses or anything like that. Um, but what we were able to do was to uh, use this R matrix division of space and the R matrix basis and so on to describe the multi electron effect such that we could extract signatures of uh, multi electron interaction in at a second um, type uh, experiments or, or calculations or simulations. So the kinds of things that we were doing then were to look at harmonic generation and the, well, my PhD was all on harmonic generation and time dependent R matrix theory. Um, and in 2016, we were looking at things like XGV initiated high harmonic generation where we were looking at the contribution of two different electrons to the harmonic spectra. Uh, we were doing things like strong field recollision, um, uh, you know, with these interference fringes and, and recollision rings. Um, this is from fluorine minus in this particular image. Um, and we were even starting to dip our toe into the waters of at a second transient absorption spectroscopy and doing um, uh, starting off with some collaborations with experiment, which is the first time we were really able to do that with RMT. What changed in 2016 then was that we um, made a whole bunch of upgrades, in, 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 or rather we started work on a whole bunch of upgrades to the code. Um, and the first of these was to look at arbitrary polarization. And this is the main one I want to stress um, and give some detail about because it sets the platform for the work that uh, I'm going to show later on. Why is it difficult to describe processes in arbitrarily polarized light? Well, for linearly polarized light, you have a bunch of symmetry restrictions which make the description of your system uh, significantly more simple. Um, so for instance, if we start with um, a noble gas atom, as we are liable to do um, with, with our calculations, um, you start off in the S even symmetry in your ground state, an absorption of a photon in this linearly polarized field um, only takes you to one place. It can only take you to the p-odd symmetry. So you have this uh, transition, uh, this dipole uh, coupling here between the s even and, and p0 state, sorry, this one rather. Uh, and so you can move into that symmetry. And from there, there's two places you can go. You can either hop back down or you can hop up into d-even symmetry. But you can see that our Hamiltonian matrix here has this nice tridiagonal structure. Um, and this massively simplifies things in terms of um, how you describe the dynamics. If you want to go to arbitrary, polar, arbitrary polarization, however, what you have to then account for is the magnetic quantum number because the photons that we are absorbing from our, uh, from our light field will no longer conserve this magnetic quantum number. And as well as that, then we will have to account for both the even and odd symmetries because the selection rules in this arbitrarily polarized light are significantly more permissive. Um, and the result of this, if you want to describe processes in strong fields in particular, is that uh, the, the complexity of the problem just blows up. So for, for a typical process in a, in a strong uh, IR field, you might want to include up to 100 angular momenta because the field is very intense. You can absorb many photons. So let's say we want to allow our system to absorb up to, up to 100 photons. In linearly polarized light, this would require you to describe 100 symmetries, basically one for each of the angular momenta you include. 
Um, but in an arbitrarily polarized uh, light field, um, this number goes from L to 2L squared. So from 100 to 20,000 symmetries um, in, your, in your description. And not only does the number increase, but the complexity increases in terms of the number of different couplings that are possible between the different symmetries. Um, and when this is built up on a massively parallel system, as we do with RMT, um, this becomes very difficult to manage because effectively you are uh, you're distributing each of these symmetries to a different part of the computer, and then those parts have to communicate with each other and so on. So I'm not going into the details of how this was implemented or anything like that. I just wanted to give a sense of the complexity um, and credit to both Daniel Clark and Greg Armstrong, who were the postdoc and, and PhD student who worked on this project and, and sort of implemented this for us back in 2019 in this paper that's referenced at the bottom. Just quickly then, some of the other things that have happened since 2016. Um, we have, uh, oh, sorry, just to give some sense of the kinds of things that we did with this arbitrary polarization. Um, so largely, we looked at processes in atoms in circularly polarized pulses, including some nice work that you did with Carlos Group and um, Andy Maxwell in particular, looking at this these twisted electrons. Uh, strong field photo detachment um, in uh, fluorine anions, and even looking at angular streaking, um, you know, which should be familiar to most people uh, who have followed the quantum battle story, because this was a big part of our initial quantum battles conference back in 2020. Just briefly, then, some of the other things that have happened since 2016, we have also incorporated the capability to include bright Pauli correction terms um, in our Hamiltonian matrix, which allows us to describe um, these semi-relativistic um, uh, effects, and in particular to look at the spin of our system and the spin of the outgoing electron in particular. We published a few pieces um, using this capability, looking at spin polarization um, in circularly polarized pulses, and looking at this um, interesting sort of auto-ionizing effect where we get these oscillations depending on um, the polarization of the light that we use. Um, and most recently, my PhD student, Luke, um, applied uh, this uh, this capability to look at, at rabbit, um, and we see this spin orbit splitting in the harmonics and sidebands of our system. I'll explain more about rabbit uh, presently. Um, the last thing um, which I mentioned just about the capability expansion that has happened in RMT um, up until uh, quite recently. Every single talk that I gave about RMT was followed immediately by the first question from the audience, which was, can you do molecules? And we always had to say no. Um, but thanks to the efforts of Jakob Benda and Stenek Maschin and Jimena Gorfinkiel, um, we now have the capability to describe uh, molecules in RMT. And we haven't yet really been able to leverage this capability, but um, this paper was published a few years ago, looking at strong field ionization of um, H2 and of, of water molecules. And we're hoping that in the next several years, we'll be able to build up that capability uh, and really begin to leverage this. OK, so just as a summary of what RMT can do, uh, we can describe any kind of single ionization process um, and we can do that from the XUV all the way up to the IR. So we can look at um, single photon ionization all the way up to tunnel ionization uh, and processes like that. Uh, because of this arbitrary polarization capability, we're able to look at um, novel light fields. Uh, and in particular for molecules, we need this so we can describe the different geometries of the system. Um, what the R-matrix method is really good at is including uh, electron correlation and this flexible uh, description of the atomic or molecular structure allows us to sort of zero in on what it is in the uh, in the atomic or molecular system, which is causing um, whatever it is we see in, in the observables. And as I've just mentioned there as well, for atoms, we also have this capability to describe these semi-relativistic effects and include the spin of the, the electron. And what we get from RMT, the sort of output, if you like, well, we're solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation. What we have at the end of it is the wave function. And in principle, if, if we have the wave function, we have a complete description of the system. Um, one of the important things we can get from the wave function is to calculate the time dependent expectation value of the dipole. Uh, and this is what gives rise to um, calculations of the harmonic spectrum, for instance. So you need the, the dipole to calculate the harmonic spectrum. And also you use that for calculating. Um, the absorption spectrum, which we use for out second transient absorption spectroscopy. Uh, of course, we can look at photoelectron um, density and momenta. So I'm going to be showing a lot of um, later in the talk. 
we can we can do rabbit as that's going to be the subject of what I talk about. Um, but all of this can be done with this kind of under the hood insight into how all of the observables are built up. So we can look to see particular uh, particular configurations or particular partial waves of the outgoing electron or particular residual ion states uh, or whatever it might be. How all of the uh, how the ultimate observable, which uh, is seen in experiment is comprised of the various pieces um, in our atomic or molecular structure description. So there's more details about RMT. This is a paper we published several years ago, um, which sort of was the, the first release of RMT. Um, the source code is also openly available on GitLab. Um, I, I should say, because I've seen the names of some of the people on the call, that RMT is also freely available through the AM, A, AMOS gateway, the Atomic Molecular and Optical Science Gateway, um, if you're interested, I, I haven't put the, the link uh, on the slide here, but amosgateway.org. Um, and you can find a bunch of uh, these types of tools like RMT, which have been made freely available with access to um, some of the um, biggest supercomputers in the US and elsewhere. Uh, and you can access and use these, these tools uh, via a web interface. Um, so I've got, the, I've got the plug in there and, and haven't upset Catherine, who's on the call, who's the PI of that project. Um, so that, that's RMT, um, and that's really all I kind of want to say about RMT in this talk, but I will come back at the end just to, to, to recap on these capabilities, because our hope is um, that either um, you will kind of see the, 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 the benefits of using this tool and be able to take it on yourself, or perhaps more realistically, um, until we do some work on making RMT a little bit more usable, um, that you might have some idea about how we might exploit the, the, the capabilities of RMT um, so that we could work together to uh, use this tool to do good science. Um, as I mentioned at the start, there's a lot of uh, work goes into kind of maintaining the codes and, and making the software more usable and so on. Um, and because of that, we often don't have time to think about what are the interesting things that we might do with RMT. So if you've got those ideas, please do reach out and get in touch with us. Okay, before I get on to talking about the main results, uh, I just wanted to kind of give my perspective a little bit on out of second science and in particular where RMT fits into um, what this community does. I tend to think of out of second science as existing on this sort of continuum. Um, and at one end of this spectrum, we have people who are interested in describing processes in strong fields. So primarily long wavelength, intense radiation, which describe, uh, which is, is necessary for describing things like high harmonic generation or strong field ionization. I put classical question mark here because the way that my brain works when I think about processes in these uh, fields is to address them, as I mentioned at the start, using something like the three-step model and describing electron trajectories and so on, even though we can do that in a quantum mechanical way um, using the, uh, the strong field approximation and so on. Um, we can kind of envisage things in this, in this kind of strong field regime as being electrons being driven on these trajectories. At the other end of the spectrum, then you have processes which are really more approaching the sort of perturbative regime where you have only a few photons. So um, either shorter wavelength or lower intensity or both. Um, and the kinds of uh, pulses then that people are using, the reason this qualifies as out of, out of second science is because we are using either out of second pulse trains or isolated out of second pulses. In here, of course, we sort of have an inherently quantum picture because you're having to describe um, sort of individual partial waves and so have some understanding of the quantum numbers. And this is going to come up, come back um, to haunt me later on as I try to describe what we've done uh, with, with Rabbit. Um, but then the kinds of observables or experiments that people are doing are to sort of look at rabbit um, and uh, add a second transient absorption spectroscopy. Uh, so because you kind of have these two ends of the spectrum, what has happened just sort of naturally is that you have uh, computational or theoretical techniques which are really well uh, tuned for describing processes either at this end of the spectrum or at that. So you have sort of perturbation theory based methods at this end, and you have maybe strong field approximation or trajectory based methods more generally uh, at this end of the spectrum. Uh, and, and never the twain shall meet, right? Uh, you, you can't take a trajectory based model and, and apply it easily in this regime and vice versa. Um, and that's sad because in some sense, the interesting physics, um, or, or rather there's a lot of interesting unexplored physics in, in, there must be in, in between here. And part of the reason that we haven't been able to describe that is, is because of the difficulty of this um, kind of mixed bag that you have in the middle. 
Um, and what's been quite pleasing in the last several years, and, and I tend to think of this in terms of the work that my own PhD students have done, is that we've started to see these um, these two halves sort of moving towards each other. And that's happened partially because of the advancements in experimental techniques, as far as I can see, um, but also because of advances that have taken place in, in our sort of computational methods and theoretical methods more generally. Uh, and, and so there are results which I, I won't be able to show today because my focus is on, is on rabbit. Um, but my PhD student, Linda Hutchison, has done some wonderful work um, really exploring at a second transient absorption spectroscopy, but in the context of strong field ionization. And we've had a really fruitful collaboration with um, Christian Ott and Thomas Pfeiffer in Heidelberg on that piece of work. And that's sort of bringing the kind of state resolved um, kind of perspective uh, to this, these kind of strong, stronger field processes. And most of the work that I'm going to talk about today is, is work um, that has been contributed to largely by um, other PhD student, Luke Rowntree, um, kind of bringing rabbit and these shoe photon processes sort of more towards the strong field regime. And indeed, rabbit hop, which is the sort of ultimate aim I want to land on um, today, is looking at higher order processes. So basically where we include more than just two photons in our description of rabbit. Anyway, that's just my perspective on, on the sort of the, the spectrum of, of various things that people do in out of second science. I'll, I'll show this again at the end just to, to, to kind of recontextualize everything I've talked about. But let's finally get on to talking about some results um, and, and get, get on to rabbit. So as a, as a primer for those who maybe aren't uh, familiar with this technique and as a refresher for those of us who are, uh, the rabbit technique, rabbit stands for the reconstruction of at a second beating by the interference of two photon transitions. Uh, and so the two photon processes that we're interested in arise from uh, the, the combined effects of an at a second pulse train and an IR. So an at a second pulse train is composed of odd harmonics of the underlying driving IR. Uh, and so in, uh, under the influence of an at a second pulse train, um, our system may absorb uh, one photon, and those photons will have these discrete energies, um, which correspond to odd harmonics of our IR. I've labeled these M here because we tend to refer to them as the main bands. Uh, and this sort of corresponds to some figures that I'll show later on. Um, so we can absorb a photon and end up, for instance, um, with an energy in the continuum corresponding to 15 times the IR energy, or 17 um, here. And then subsequent interaction with our IR will cause either emission or absorption of one more photon, which brings us to this energy in the continuum, which we label as a sideband. SB16 here sits between the two main bands, M15 and M17. And so our photoelectron spectrum will look something like this, where we have these larger main peaks, which are the result of the one photon process um, brought about by the XUV. Um, at a second pulse train. And these smaller um, sideband peaks, which are the result of the two photon process. Um, and because each of these sideband peaks can be reached by two different two photon transitions. So one transition from M15 and up and the other from M17 and down, we will see interference between those two different pathways. And that is manifest when we vary the time delay between these two pulses or the phase relationship between the two pulses. And so what we end up producing is something like this, this rabbit spectrum, which is the photoelectron spectrum as a function of time delay. And this sideband will oscillate with twice the frequency of the IR. And it oscillates with twice the frequency because there's a two omega separation between these two intermediate states, M15 and M17. And by interrogating the form of this oscillation, what we can do is, is fit this oscillation. So we take a line out here along this sideband as a function of time delay, and we'll get something which looks vaguely sinusoidal like this. And we can then compare the phase or, or the sort of offset of these two, um, say, with, with each other. And it's the phase difference between these two, which can then shed light on the underlying atomic physics. So part of this phase of this oscillation can be attributed to um, the basically the absorption of the first photon. Part of it can be attributed to the absorption of the second photon, what we call the continuum continuum phase, um, because this is a, it takes place, uh, these transitions are between two continuum states. Um, and by uh, carefully monitoring this phase and, and making clever analyses of this phase, we can say various things about resonance effects within our, our, our atomic system or about the continuum dynamics of our, of our electron wave packet and so on. Um, and this is rabbit. So this, this is the basic picture. 
I just wanted again to offer some perspective on on why this is a, an interesting development, uh, and obviously the the, um, the 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 with the Nobel Prize being awarded last year, uh, as it was in out of second science, that this this technique uh, has sort of been um, promoted and profiled a little bit. But when I was an undergraduate student, I had a lecturer called Colin Latimer, and Colin Latimer taught me uh, quantum mechanics. And his catchphrase when teaching us quantum mechanics was, "The wave function is meaningless." and unobservable. And what I guess he was trying to um, sort of really compound in our brains was the idea that you have to square the wave function to get the probability density, and that then tells you where your electron lives. Um, and basically, I've spent my entire academic career trying to prove this statement wrong. Because of course, if we have the amplitude of a particular process, yes, fine, we, we, can, we can sort of see that as a probability density. But what the rabbit technique really gives us is insight into the phase of the underlying dynamics. And if we have the phase, then we can begin to characterize the wave function um, in, in kind of directly. Um, and most, most of what I'm about to show in, in the results that we've got has been an effort towards this to actually characterize both the amplitude and phase of particular um, of the electron wave packet and that arises from these two photon processes. So this is a, it's a little bit hand wavy to say, oh, the phase just gives us the wave function. Um, obviously, it's more complex than that, but this is the way I, this is my simple man's way of thinking about this. So what have we done with Rabbit that's so new? So the first piece of work that we did with Zhe Chun, Jiang Wu, and so on, um, it was to look at what they were terming skew Rabbit. And the basic idea with skew Rabbit is that we take our standard Rabbit technique, which I've just outlined, we're addressing helium for this first part, as I'm going to explain. But instead of just varying the time delay between our two pulses, what we now do is also vary the relative polarization of our two um, our two light pulses. Um, and so we have our out of second pulse train, which we keep sort of aligned along the Z axis here. And then our IR pulse, we, we will vary the polarization from being um, aligned, which is what we call a, a, a skew angle being zero degrees, um, to being perpendicular, so a skew angle of 90 degrees. And we vary um, that, that skew angle um, such that we modify the resulting photoelectron momentum distributions, which come out um, a, a, in the measurement. So what you get is something like this. Obviously, this is just for a single time delay, uh, or it may in fact be integrated over all the time delays. I, I can't quite remember. But in any case, you get a photoelectron momentum distribution like this for each time delay and for each skew angle. So we now have an enormous amount of data because we have the emission angle resolved uh, yield for each skew angle and for each time delay. Um, and what you can see here is that the skew angle modifies the particular photoelectron momentum distribution which we observe. Now, what I'd like you to pay attention to is the fact that these uh, main bands, which th th this is the easiest one to see, this, this sort of uh, heaviest red here, this, this crescent figure here, these remain unchanged largely um, for the different skew angles. And that is expected because these arise from the one photon process. Okay? And, the, and the, the out of second pulse train doesn't change. Okay? So th they, they stay the same. But the side band, and again, the easiest one to see is the innermost ring here. This kind of skews around or shears around. Um, start, everything starts off aligned along the z-axis. And then as we move down around towards 90 degrees, you can see that side band sort of shearing um, sort of in this anti-clockwise direction until at 90 degrees, we get this four lobe structure. Now, why, why, are we, why are we concerned about all of this? Well, these photoelectron momentum distributions, they arise from uh, the interference of different partial waves in the outgoing, of the outgoing electron wave packet. So in helium, we start off with our electrons in the 1S shell. So we have an S electron an absorption of two photons can take us along one of these three pathways. We can go SPS or SPD, and for the D, depending on the relative polarization of the IR, we can go to a magnetic quantum number of zero or a magnetic quantum number of one. And the momentum distributions which we observe are determined by the relative amplitude and phase of each of these partial waves. And so our hope uh, when, we, when we started this was that we could actually unpick the constituent parts that make up these photo photoelectron momentum distributions to extract the amplitude and phase of each of these individual partial waves. And that's why we call this the, the partial wave meter. So everything I've shown you so far in this slide uh, is experimental data. Uh, what do we do with RMT? Well, RMT 
can produce these same uh, observables. Okay, we can get the photoelectron momentum distributions. But once we have them, what do we do with them? Well, we, we first of all we verify that we're getting similar results. So here's the experimental spectra. I'm going to fade in the, the the ones we get from RNT and fade them back out again, and, and you can then compare them side by side in just a second. And you will, of course, observe that these two things look quite different. I mean, the experimental spectra is much noisier. Um, the features are all kind of spread out, whereas in RNT, we get these nice sharp sideband and mainband peaks. But the overall structure is what we're, we're interested in here. And in particular, you can see that the sideband modification that you get from the different skew angles is reproduced quite well in RNT. And in particular, uh, it's, it's quite faint here, but hopefully the resolution on your screens is sufficient to see this. You get this four lobe structure at 90 degrees, which, which perfectly mirrors what's happening here in the experimental results. Okay, this part is kind of useless. It, we, we, all we're really doing is verifying that RMT can reproduce the results to some extent. But then we can use the capability of RMT to actually look under the, under the surface and see what is it which is actually making up these particular distributions. So the way we can think about this is in terms of different pathways. Um, which can arise in the different orientations of the field. So when the two pulses are aligned, um, the selection rules are such that we um, have either we can end up going from S to S or S to D. So we have a delta L of two. But because we have a linearly polarized pulse, the magnetic quantum number is conserved. And so this D1 pathway is, is closed when we have um, parallel polarized pulses. If we go to uh, a 90 degree skew angle, so cross polarized, the selection rules change. And we, in particular, we must have the magnetic quantum number changing by one, okay? Because we can't, uh, because we have these, these two cross polarized pulses. And what that means is that there's only one pathway available because we can't go to S because you can't have uh, an S symmetry with a magnetic quantum number of one. Um, and similarly, because we, we need the magnetic not what quantum number to change by one, this is the only pathway that's there. And when we have some intermediate polarization, some intermediate skew angle, between the two pulses, um, we have all of the different possibilities and we're going to get some mixing between these. Okay, so with RMT, what we can do is explicitly calculate um, the amplitude and phase of each partial wave. That We just get that from, from our simulation. Obviously, in experiment, you just get the resulting photoelectron momentum distributions, but can we then use our, uh, use our knowledge of the way these things must be built up to extract the amplitude and phases? Well, we should be able to because the sideband is just given to us by this distribution, okay? That the YLM here are just the different spherical harmonics corresponding to these symmetries, these partial waves. And each of these spherical harmonics will have an associated amplitude, the coefficient, uh, and the C LM there, and phase given by phi LM. Um, and the hope is then that we can use this, this, uh, this formula to fit the, uh, the experimental spectra use all of the data that we have for all of the different time delays, all of the different emission angles, all of the different skew angles, um, to eliminate the various unknowns in this problem, to land on um, the amplitudes and phases. And then we can compare that with RMT, which gives us these numbers directly to see uh, if we've got a good uh, reconstruction. And so what I'm gonna show you then now is that the, the amplitude, first of all, and the, the colored bars here are the results from RMT. So like I say, we just kind of get this directly from our calculation. Uh, and then there's actually two sets of uh, data points here. One of them, the triangles comes from another analytical method which we developed just to verify our findings. But the circles and squares are the actual experimental reconstruction or rather the reconstruction from the experimental data. And you can see that the amplitudes here are perfectly um, re uh, reconstructed from the experimental data. They match really nicely with the RMT. And in particular, just to kind of point out what I was saying before, um, at, zero, at a zero degree skew angle, I mentioned this D1 pathway is, is forbidden. And so you can see that the amplitude is zero there. At 90 degrees, only the D1 contributes. So you can see that that's, uh, that's coming up there. Uh, and at the intermediate angles, you get some mixing of these three. Okay, great, we can get the amplitude, but can we prove my physics lecturer wrong and also get the phase? Well, yes, we can. And this is um, the uh, theoretical, so the RMT results on the left-hand side and the experimental results on the right-hand side. So again, from our fitting procedure, we're able to extract the phase of each of these individual, each of these three pathways, each of these three partial waves. And although the spread is, is quite a bit larger in the experimental results, you can see the error bars are a bit larger there as well. And the trend and the relative size, um, and um, in fact, the, the actual numbers are, are, are kind of pleasingly close here as well.
Okay, so all of this is summarized in this Nature Communications paper from 2022. Um, you see all of the details there. Um, and what we call this the partial wave meter, basically can we measure the amplitude and phase of these final state um, partial waves? But I've only told you part of the story because the, at that experimental run, um, what they also did was to do this experiment with he, uh, sorry, with argon and neon. So helium, in some sense, is quite straightforward because we just have this um, S, um, one S squared shell is our ground state. Uh, and so we just have a single intermediate state leading us to our three possible final states. For argon and neon, the situation is vastly more complicated because we have as our ground state, um, we have this 3P6 is our valence shell. And so we can have either P0 or P1 electrons. Um, and depending on the various orientations of the field and so on, we have multiple different pathways to lead us to our final state. And so the situation is significantly more complex. And in that first paper, this nature communications paper, um, we only really kind of were able to reconstruct the partial wave amplitude and phase for helium. Uh, so the question remains, can we do anything for argon and neon? And everything I'm about to show you is for neon, just to keep the, 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 the things a bit simpler, but you can do the same thing for argon as well. And the complexity, as I mentioned, stems from the fact that we have, um, well, I, I didn't mention yet, but we, we, we have a, this P symmetry um, and therefore we have multiple different residual ion states that we can leave. So by emitting a P0 electron, we get one residual ion state by emitting a P1 electron. Sorry, this should be P plus or minus one electron. Um, we get a different residual ion state and it's the incoherent sum of these two, which gives rise to the final picture. And that's what makes things complex. But I want to draw your attention to the middle part here, because what you can see is that some of these pathways have two possible intermediate states. And that's very different from what we saw for helium, where we just had one intermediate state, this P0 here. And this is where the interest really lies. And in the second piece of work that we published with Judge Hinn and his group, um, what we began to do was to think about this in terms of something like the double slit experiment. Okay, So hopefully everyone's familiar with the double slit experiment. Uh, where we say irradiate um, a, a double slit and the light then which comes from each of these two slits causes an interference fringe on the detector screen and from that interference you can learn something about the light but famously you can't know which way um, the light went okay so individual photons do they go through this slit or that slit we do the same thing with electrons do they go through this slit or that slit we don't know but our suspicion was that for this particular case, if we thought about it in terms of the double slit experiment, we should be able to reconstruct not only the amplitude and phase of the final state, but also to unpick the process so that we could understand the amplitude and phase of these intermediate states also. And so basically what we're doing is we're working out which way is the electron going when it passes through one, one or other of these two slits. So what follows gets a little bit involved and I regret that I'm sort of running out of time um, so I might have to skip over some details, but I, I promise you that we'll, we'll land somewhere nice in the end, um, because what we're able to do is uh, effectively open up this black box and uniquely characterize the amplitude and phase uh, of these two different pathways. So just like we did before, we do RMT simulations to work out what the laser parameters are and so on, and we compare some observable to make sure that the simulation agrees nicely with the experiment. Um, and last time I showed you the photoelectron momentum spectrum, here what I'm showing you is the rabbit phase for three different sidebands for two different skew angles. And you can see that the, the, the phase that we extract, so this is the emission angle resolved phase, um, these agree re really beautifully. So we kind of know that we're onto something. Then, then we take our RMT simulations and begin to look at the individual partial waves that kind of make up the photoelectron momentum distribution in the end. Uh, and the key takeaway from this, this slide, and again, there's, there's a lot going on here. Uh, we have the, our multiple different residual ion states, which are what the P0 and P plus or minus one states, and we take incoherent sum to get the total here. But what I, what I really want to draw your attention to is we're looking at the phase as a function of the electron kinetic energy. So basically four different side bands here. And all of these partial waves have a phase behavior which is approximately flat as a function of the electron kinetic energy with the exception, and the quite obvious exception here, of this dark blue curve here, which is the P0 wave, okay? The P0 here is the one pathway which is accessible from two possible intermediate states. So another one of these, let's say the F0 here, that's accessible from only one pathway. You go P0 to D0 to F0. That's the only way to get to F0. But P0 is accessible. We can go P0 to D0 to P0 or P0 to S0. 
to P0. So there's these two possible intermediate states. And our hypothesis is that it's the interference between these two different pathways that gives rise to this um, dependence of the phase on the electron kinetic energy. And for the 90 degree skew angle, which is the bottom three uh, boxes here, it's much less noticeable, but the P1 wave um, is the one which has the sort of non-trivial or, or, or yeah, non-trivial dependence on the electron kinetic energy. And that's because that is the pathway, which again has two, two intermediate states. For 90 degree polarization, we basically go from P to D or S and then to P1, whereas all of the other pathways have only a single intermediate state. Again, I realize I'm going through this quite quickly, but all of the details are in the paper that's referenced there at the bottom. What we were able to do then, and I'm going to skip over this slide largely, but we were able to then work out what is the quantum number dependence of the phase shifts. Okay, And we we're able to um, ascertain that the continuum continuum phase shift depends on the orbital angular momentum of the uh, intermediate state, but it doesn't depend on the magnetic quantum number. Okay. Um, You'll have to take my word for it because we're, we're running short on time. But we use all of this information um, to build up um, some formula for the interference. So basically, the, the, this, uh, this rabbit spectrum that we build up um, and the phase that we extract from the rabbit for each of our P0 and P1 waves, we basically hypothesize that what we see in the experiment should be composed of formulas that look like this. So one, this, this top one for the zero degree skew angle, this one for the 90 degree skew angle, we actually have another one. Um, which is kind of used as a point of reference. And again, what we're trying to do then is solve these equations simultaneously, eliminating the various unknowns. And our target is not just to get this two, um, this two photon phase, which is basically the phase and amplitude of the, uh, of the final state um, uh, uh, partial wave in, in our experiment, which is what we did previously. Our ultimate goal is can we get the amplitude, relative amplitude between the P to S or P to D transition and the relative phase between the PSP and PDP transition. This is what we're ultimately aiming at, because this will then uniquely characterize what's going on in this double slit part. Uh, and indeed, we're able to do that. So this is kind of what we did previously, looking at the final state. So we get the, the, the phase of the P0 wave for the zero degree case, or the P1 wave um, for the 90 degree case. And again, the data points here are reconstructed from the experiment. The lines are from RMT. But really what we're interested in is, is this intermediate state. And again, here you can see that the, the experimental data, which are the colored dots here, um, agree really nicely with the, the data we get directly from RMT. So what have we done here then? I, I've, I've just given the references for the, the two papers so you can check up on all the details. But what we, are do, what we are using RMT to do is to sort of benchmark these experimental reconstruction methods where we can actually extract the amplitude and phase of the various partial waves which make up um, these uh, the, the observables in these rabbit experiments. Okay, quickly then, just to finish, I wanted to show something of, of rabbit hop. I mentioned this spectrum before, and I, I mentioned the fact that my PhD student, Luke, has been doing some work to try and extend rabbit beyond this few photon picture, so where we just have these two photon transitions to look at uh, something more, and we're calling this rabbit hop, rabbit with higher order processes. And just to give you a sneak preview, because like I said, we're working on um, sort of uh, writing this up at the minute. With uh, low intensity lasers, your rabbit spectrum looks something like this. So you, you get this time delay uh, dependence for your sidebands and so on. And if you take a Fourier transform along this time delay axis, what you expect to see is that each of these sidebands should oscillate at two here, two being twice the IR frequency. If you go to higher intensities, however, there are more different transition pathways available, some of which arise from, um, from, from states which are separated by four times the IR frequency. And therefore, you should see oscillations at four on this axis, four times uh, omega IR. And indeed, for these higher intensity IR pulses, that's exactly what you see. And the reason for this is because you have these multiple different pathways. So these two pathways are the standard pathways I've already explained for rabbit. But if I have a pathway which starts down here and I absorb three photons, that can interfere with a pathway which starts with an absorption up to here and I absorb one and emit two. I end up with the same sideband energy, but the interference term now will oscillate with four times uh, omega IR because we started off separated by four omega IR. And we've been doing the RMT simulations and finding we get these four omega oscillations in there. And 
the paper which Luke is working on contains lots of diagrams like this showing all of the different pathways and sort of enumerating um, using combinatorics all of the various different routes um, to get to a specific sideband energy in the end. Here's a picture of Luke who has developed rabbit hop. Um, and so watch this space for that basically. So that's that's my um, summary with the, the two papers that we've already published and rabbit hop will be coming really soon. So just to finish up with then, I just wanted to show this slide again that I showed earlier on. This is what we're able to do with RMT currently. I'll just uh, get everything on the screen. Um, we are interested in both ends of this uh, spectrum, as I mentioned earlier, going from strong field type processes where we're looking at HHG, strong field ionization, strong field recollision, those kinds of things, all the way up to um, beginning to think about how we might describe um, inner shell ionization and so on in, in X-ray pulses, things we might do with free electron laser radiation and that kind of thing. But because we have one method which is able to, of describing this whole spectrum, um, the hope is that we're not kind of making any modeling assumptions and so on, which might uh, lead us to, to false conclusions. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we, we're currently able to do. Some of the developments that we're making will lift this restriction to look at just single ionization. Um, Carla and, and I and Hugo and Martin Plummer, who I saw was on the, on the call, uh, we have had a grant to sort of develop capability to look at double ionization in RNT and combine that with some of the capability of the uh, Coulomb uh, corrected quantum strong field approximation method, which, which Carla's group has, um, to look at double ionization processes. Um, and additionally, Hugo van der Hart, um, my colleague and former PhD supervisor has been developing a new methodology where we can use the output of RMT um, to construct a density matrix, which then allows us to model multiple stages of sequential ionization processes um, with the data from RMT, which is really exciting. So uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all of the people. I don't know why those names have moved like that. Oh, they've all managed to move while I'm trying to talk about them. Um, these are the people who have contributed to the development of RMT over the years. Um, I mentioned Greg and Daniel in particular who developed this arbitrary polarization stuff and Jack who did all of the relativistic um, things um, and then my three current PhD students Sean, Linda uh, and Luke um, who, where is Luke? There he is over there, um, who, who have been doing a lot of the, the science applications of this stuff recently. For the rabbit hop work, um, where are we? Here's the, here, here's the collaboration for the rabbit hop. Um, apparently not, it's disappeared. Um, I'll put my slides back up and hopefully uh, that will do for, for um, presentation. And these are all the people who've been involved um, in the development of RMT, but also in the rabbit hop. I should mention Zhao Chun Gong, from, uh, formerly of East China Normal University, um, and Kyoshi Ueda, um, uh, uh, and uh, various other people who've been involved there. But thank you so much for your attention, and my apologies for running a little bit over time, but I hope we have time now for, for questions and some discussions about all of this. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much. It's really enlightening to see what can be done. Other questions, comments, either raise your hand or write in the Q&A tab. And while we are waiting, I would like to thank everyone because uh, we have reached in our YouTube channel 600 subscribers, which, okay, it's not like yoga with Adrian or stuff like that who has millions, but still for quite a niche channel, uh, we are really thankful for your support. Uh, it is uh, an achievement. And uh, thank you so much, because otherwise uh, we wouldn't be here today. And uh, we have also quite a lot of people who joined from pretty much everywhere. So is there anybody who would like to ask something? I mean, before Easter, people were tired. Uh, we have one. Okay, very good. Now we are not tired anymore. So when Lee, nice talk, thanks. What's the difference between the analytical R matrix and RMT? So uh, it's been uh, many years since I looked at the analytical R matrix work. So this was developed out of the um, Max Born Institute, as far as I remember, with Lisa Torlina and uh, Zolga Shmerno, who's group there. Um, as far as I recall the differences, um, I think in the analytical R matrix, you are solving the sort of initial ionization stage in the inner region, and then you're sort of propagating the outer region solution uh, without updating what's going on in the inner region. So any kind of residual ion effects, so if you have you know, the, the ion sort of rearranging after the ionization, I don't think this is captured in the analytical R matrix method. Whereas in RMT, because we're doing this kind of um, step by step, 
we were able to update the condition of the wave function in the inner region so that any effects within the residual ion are also captured in the dynamics. So this is particularly important if you want to describe processes like autoionization, um, because obviously this depends on the rearrangement of electrons in the residual ion. Um, and I, I may be wrong, but as far as I recall it, I don't think those residual ion dynamics are captured in the analytical R matrix method. I mean, the other difference is the analytic, analytical R matrix method doesn't require tens of thousands of um, CPU cores and lots of uh, resource to, to actually get answers. But um, so there's lots of advantages for that too. Uh, is this clear? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, Catherine Hamilton, just out of curiosity, how many states in your RMT consideration were used in your rabbit hop calculations for helium? Mm -hmm. It was really basic. We, we used, uh, uh, so I know Catherine will be familiar, we used the 1T basis for, for helium. So we literally have one residual ion state. Um, and, you know, it, it's a really, really basic description. We found that including additional residual ion states and more configurations and so on didn't make any difference to the um, to the results. Now, um, I maybe Luke might be able to comment on this, but um, when we get to looking at the um, the sort of resonance imprint and so on, it may be that including more um, states gives us a better. Oh, thank you. There's Luke. It may be that using a, a slightly more involved description gives us a better description of the resonance. But to be honest with you, as far as I recall, that resonance is fairly well described just with the single residual ion state. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Luke. Do you have a comment on that? Did we do anything with with mult with larger descriptions? In, in the early days, we tried the 3T model and we saw almost no difference. Um, in those days, we were only looking at the two omega signals. When we started looking at the, it was before we started looking at the four omega signals as well. We saw no difference in the two omega signals. Yeah. Um, and that, that was true of all of the sort of resonance imprints that we saw in the side bands and main bands and so on as well, I believe, right? Uh, from a memory, yes. Yeah, OK. So yeah, it's nothing like the level of detail that you you lot uh, in America are including in your HHG simulations for helium. It's much, much simpler than that. Um, but that's kind of one of the surprising things about this, that you can get the dynamics and get really good agreement with experiment, even with a relatively simple model. And I should say that in some sense, this, this represents a sort of um, value difference in, in the way that some people treat this kind of thing. With, with RMT in principle, you should be able to just throw more and more atomic structure at everything and get a more and more precise answer. Um, but for a lot of applications, what we're really trying to do, I mean, it's not that we're trying to get agreement with experiments. We're not trying to fudge things so that things agree. Um, but we're also aware that a lot of the details in our RMT simulation are just not going to be visible in an experiment. Um, if you're looking at HHG, for instance, you have to take a kind of all the macroscopic effects and, and how things sort of um, add up coherently and in, in, through the medium and so on. Um, so really fine details in the harmonic spectrum just might not be visible in experiment. Now, for me, as a computational theorist, I would say, well, stuff the experimentalists. This is the real science, right? We can actually see the real effects. So why would we not do this? Um, but that's what I was talking about a little bit in in this idea of the spectrum in out of second science. Um, if we're if if we're always just trying to do our own thing and never try to close that gap, I feel like it might hinder our progress a little bit. So. Um, yeah, we, we could use more advanced descriptions of our atomic systems, and certainly our matrix uh, theory has been built up explicitly for that purpose, to give you these really high precision calculations for astrophysical spectra and so on. Um, but at the minute, most of our efforts are sort of in this middle ground where we have not all that much in the way of atomic structure, but we're really trying to get a grip on the dynamics and so on. Good. Thanks for the question, Catherine. A nice, nice softball, easy question for me. Yeah, uh, now, Wen Li again, if I may, one more question on the capability of RMT. How big molecules can it handle with spin included CH3I? Uh, you can speak. I, I I allowed you to speak. I put you on the panel. So yeah, well, I, 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 can answer, I can answer the question very quickly. The largest molecule you can describe with spin is an atom. We can't do spin for molecules yet. Um, so th this was maybe unclear in my description because I did skim over some of this. But the the bright poly correction terms, which we're including um, in, in the description, these are only implemented for atomic systems at the minute. So the description for molecules is uh, strictly non-relativistic at present. Now, that being said, Zdenek Mashin and Jakob Benda 
uh, who are working on um, the sort of molecular side of RMT, Charles University in Prague. Uh, I happen to know that they they have just submitted a proposal um, to include relativistic effects in the UK RML plus codes, which are the codes which are used to produce input data for molecular RMT calculations. So if they get that working, then we should be able to look at spin in molecules. Uh, and then I can give you a slightly more positive answer to your question um, the next time around. Great, thanks. Okay, thanks. So are there further questions? I mean, if you don't like to ask questions and be all over YouTube, wait and hang in there because we're going to stop the streaming and you're going to have the chance to talk to our speaker in a more private setting. But there is something as well, some anonymous person, just a last comment. I'm afraid I cannot take credit. The above, Catherine, is either Juan del Valle, Aaron Bonzi, or Anne Hart really <laughs> talk. Uh, I totally agree on the perspective of performing these calculations. Okay, so it wasn't Catherine. It was Catherine to pseudo Catherine. <laughs> the question. All right. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I saw she had a double link. You know this. Yeah, I just, I just thought she was really keen. She wanted to attend twice, but apparently not. <laughs> Sometimes we have like three people with the same link, but we don't worry too much about that anymore. Okay, yeah. so people on YouTube, we are stopping now. Take good care of yourselves. Hope you to hope to see you in two weeks.